Steve and I both have short presentations on modern brachytherapy. Um, these are our disclosures. The learning objectives. So first, we're going to review the rationale of brachytherapy for the treatment of prostate cancer and the evidence supporting the guidelines. We're going to review our toxicity and our modern, and modern techniques to mitigate symptoms affecting quality of life after treatment, and then discuss the 2020 modern approach to brachytherapy and new ideas of cure. So a little history to begin with, um, Dr. H.H. H. Young, more than 100 years ago, uh, John Hopkins urologist working on a technique that was being developed at Memorial Sloan Kettering for cervical cancer. He started doing, in, in, he invented interstitial brachytherapy and that started us off, 1914. He's also credited with conceiving the radical perineal prostatectomy. So first, just principles of radiation oncology, there is no such thing as a radio-resistant tumor. Failure to cure localized cancer is due to two things. One is inadequate dose, that's why we play around with dose escalation studies, and geographic miss, that's why we care so much about IGRT. Um, and this is what Brakey actually excels at, is conquering those two issues. So LDR and HDR brachytherapy are two techniques. They are more similar than they are different. They are both first-line recommendations for all NCCN risk groups. They are different, however, in dosing, in optimization, in capital investment. They are both outpatient procedures today. They can be performed very elegantly. The modern technique, and this is what Steven's going to really go into, the modern technique is very much a multidisciplinary technique in a, where we use our best imaging, MRI for instance, fused to an ultrasound, and our best computer software, there's three different um, programs out there in the OR to optimize and create ideal, consistent seed implants. So this is not about stranded seeds, interop. It's not about loose seeds or MIC. This is about interoperative optimization that we do today for consistency. It's also, reviews, it, it reduces power barriers in the OR. These are projected on the screen. Everybody can tell what I'm doing. We talk about it. We calculate it. And we can show if we have green lights or red lights and how good we're doing with our implant. We never leave without an ideal implant today. So this is what I'm going to talk about first is the evidence for prostate brachytherapy. And we have retrospective series, large U.S. database queries, guidelines, expert opinions, systematic reviews, but we have level one evidence, and I'm going to focus on that. And then a couple of level two evidence, a couple of phase two studies on quality of life. So we'll start first with surgery versus brachytherapy. And there's been a couple of attempts at this. This was a completed study published in 2009. You can see the kaplan mile survival curves. They're nearly identical out long term. But these are low-risk guys. These aren't guys that, we, that I personally treat anymore. But we've learned some real data from this. First, the PSA outcome is identical. Um, sex function, overall quality of life appear the same. But prostate brachytherapy has problems. We have 20% LUTs, 10% retention, 2% stricture in this prospective randomized study. These are things we have to address. So next, I want to move on to RTOG0232 and also to a higher risk group. These were mostly favorable intermediate risk. This was conceived in 2002 in an era where we did a lot of combination therapy or we did external beam with hormones. And the experimental question was, can we get away with prostate brachytherapy alone? So we randomized 588 folks, combo versus seeds alone, and had a median follow-up of 6.7 years, long-term follow-up. We have nearly identical results. And just to dive a little deeper, the PSA results are the same with brachy alone versus combination. Local failure rates are quite uncommon, rare, and there's less toxicity with monotherapy. We all know that. You add more, you're going to get more toxicity in this multi-group or multi-institutional prospective study stricture rate was about three percent so the bottom line for these favorable intermediate men uh, get uh, um, you do not need an external beam boost and the old thinking was who needs prostate brachytherapy the reality is who needs external beam and clearly not these men on this study so now on to the ascend rt study there's been four nice publications this was done in british columbia 400 men with mostly high-risk prostate cancer. They all got ADT and some IMRT, and then they were randomized to modern IMRT as their final boost or prostate brachytherapy. 
and you can see the Kaplan Myers survival curves at 6.5 years, and you see that the prostate brachytherapy arm, the experimental arm, is stable past five years and really separates, and we continue to have beam failures. So looking a little bit deeper on this, the nine-year data, so 62% PSA control rate with beam alone in these high-risk people that also got ADT versus with combination therapy, 83%, a difference of 21%. It's seen across both unfavorable intermediate risk folks and high risk folks. This is a big difference. Um, that means the number needed to treat approximately five to benefit one patient. And then if we take a look further at the PSA endpoint of, of surgical endpoint of 0 0.2, here we got external beam at seven years of only 38% achieving this with beam and seeds combination. It's 85%, nearly a 50% difference. So at this point, you're, you're, you're treating two patients just to benefit one. The toxicity is more with combination therapy. Those are issues we're dealing with and we're gonna tell you how. So for the Ascend RT study, the PSA outcome differences are large. Five years is inadequate to assess effectiveness between these two modalities. Brachytherapy in comparison to external beam has stable long-term outcomes and no overall survival difference. Does that matter? That's a criticism, and let's just take a look at it. Prostate cancer is a long natural history, we know. New systemic agents improve over sur overall survival, and most importantly, we have competing risks, but if, like D'Amico did, like Herbert and Pickles, if you control for healthy men and you control their PSA, you're gonna increase overall survival by, a, by as much as 20%, so it does matter. So this is HDR data, and I'm, this is my final outcome data. Um, this was a phase two feasibility study conceived in 2003 when NIH used to support this sort of thing. This is 10-year outcome data using HDR as a boost. Um, the prostate-specific mortality was 6%, very favorable in comparison to other, other RTOG studies. The grade three GIGU event rate was a mere 4% at five years, 5% at 10 years. And again, our local control rate is very high. 98%. So where are we uh, on the toxicity question? We cause LUTs, we cause retention, obstruction, and stricture, but we own it and we have to move forward, and I do believe we can get better. Real quickly, before I turn this over to Stephen, there is data for us to focus on. Um, I've been using Sanda's data for as much as 12 years for informed consent of patients. Um, and Gerard Morton's HDR data using the same EPIC CP, so this is a report of distress at two years. We all know it. This came out last week. Hoffman and Penson published this in JAMA. Essentially, it's the same thing as the, the Sanda, Sanda multi-institutional um, data using EPIC CP, but it's, it, this is now contemporary techniques of RALP and IMRT, um, and it's five-year data instead of two-year data. In their discussion, they focused on the changes and differences in incontinence and sex function. Also, another finding is we don't see this detriment in bowel function with our more modern IMR, uh, IMRT technique that we saw in the SANDA study. We have data comparing RALP versus prostate brachytherapy from MD Anderson. Um, with RALP, you have less obstruction, so better um, urinary bother scores um, in bowel function. Prostate brachytherapy, perhaps better sexual function, less incontinence, and, patient, and more patient satisfaction. You can see the radar plot. And we have toxicity by isotope. We all use cesium, iodine, palladium. There are no differences. You can see the radar plot as well. And finally, and I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen now, just wanna point out, this is his prospective study, quality, quality of life study on 300 patients, all intermediate risk disease. This is his five-year data. He's a very detailed researcher, 97% PSA control rate. With the modern technique and with the detail we try to apply to every patient today, he, he's shown here his stricture rate is less than 1%, and that's really the message um, that I wanna share, and this is where we're going. So with that, I'll invite Stephen up. Stephen's data, so it's not, brachytherapy is not your father's Oldsmobile, and Stephen's gonna take us from cars to Mars, which is, MRI-assisted prostate brachytherapy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Peter, and thanks for uh, moderating and inviting me to the session, and thank you, Dave, for having uh, inviting me to come and share in this fantastic environment and meeting. Um, one of the things that we're gonna, I'd like to discuss uh, is 
some of the issues that we're facing and what we're doing to solve them. Um, we really know that MRI, as we all know in here, and there's been a lot of discussion on MRI and will be tomorrow, and has a clear soft tissue delineation. And that's true in the brachytherapy space as well. Uh, this is a paper that we showed with ultrasound seeds, CT, and MRI at the base, mid gland, and at the apex. Um, that MRI has clearly better soft tissue delineation, but the real problem is that the, in, under MRI, it's very difficult to localize these seeds. Um, under ultrasound, you can't even see what the apex looks like, and you can't see that under CT. And here we have the external urinary sphincter, and that's the big driver of, of the urinary morbidity. And for most radiation oncologists, it's very difficult to appreciate what that looks like and see um, under ultrasound, it looks just like the apex of the prostate. But as you all know, it's a very important structure. It has a one centimeter diameter structure between the heads of the pubic rectalis muscle. And if you implant seeds into that, it's going to cause morbidity uh, that can be avoided. So the Achilles heel of brachytherapy really is ultrasound and CT-based dosimetry. Uh, currently, for um, um, residents, the ACGME requirements uh, are, the, are none for prostate brachytherapy. In radiation oncology training today, five interstitial implants are required to go up before your boards, and that can be done in GYN or that can be done in prostate, but it has to, does not have to be done in brachytherapy. Training and proficiency can take six, to, uh, six months to a year. There's no U.S. fellowship training program. The uncertainties are high um, because most radiation oncologists are not trained how to use a ultrasound. You can't see the intraprosthetic tumors, poor resolution of normal anatomy, and overall the quality assurance is less than ideal. And, and where does that come into play? Well, this is, this is from the VA incident in Philadelphia. Uh, this was back in, two, in, the, in the late 2009 where you had all these implants that were done, uh, likely implanting the penile bulb um, because of poor quality implants and poor training. And this really shut brachytherapy down within the VA system over the last decade. Um, and most VAs don't do it. If you're going to get a prostate brachytherapy implant in the VA on the west side, west coast, you, you end up going up to Seattle, and even that's changing. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is what's now the advancement, and this is called MRI-assisted radiosurgery, or MARS. And the reason I'm, we use the term MARS is because now we can start utilizing the surgical definition of cure, where we've, we've recently been able to take 14,000 brachytherapy patients in a database, and this is from 13,000 patients in the database from all over the world. And what we did was we looked at a definition to be able to demonstrate what cure would look like following brachytherapy. And we look at definitions of 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 5, 0.5 to 1.0, and greater than 1.0. And we looked at this at four years. And what we came to appreciate is that at four years, if your PSA is 0.2 or below, the chance of cure 10 to 15 years later is going to be 99%. So patients with a PSA less than or equal to 0.2 at four to five years have an over 98% chance of remaining disease-free beyond 15 years. And this has now been presented at ASTRO, it's presented at the ABS, um, it's, it has been submitted for a publication uh, within European Urology, and this will give us an opportunity to start communicating. And why four years? Because the PSA, benign PSA bounce, typically happens in about 40 to 50% of men within the first three and a half years. Clearly imaging, this is the type of imaging that we would like to be utilizing during all of our planning process to ensure that we're delivering high quality care and avoiding the toxicity of implanting seeds into the bladder neck, into the bladder, into the external urinary sphincter, or into the bulbar membranous urethra. What we see here, of course, we can uh, identify the urethra clearly here, and what we teach uh, is that this is about three millimeters from the anterior wall of the rectum which is critical because it's important to make sure that if there's an uh, ulcer at the anterior wall of the rectum, that we don't have unnecessary biopsies by our gastro, uh, gastro uh, intestinal uh, colleagues, the GI colleagues, because that can run the risk of a fistula that can lead to a colostomy. Here, the external urinary sphincter, that one centimeter diameter structure with the ure urethra right here, this is now an avoidable structure. And this is now what MARS, or MRI-assisted radiosurgery, affords us in terms of eliminating um, implant seeds into this, this structure. Uh, this has been further highlighted in uh, brachytherapy where we had a special edition on MRI 
and uh, imaging based brachytherapy. And this was demonstrating the first isodose lines or the radiation dose lines that are around a, uh, a brachytherapy implant. Uh, here was that first patient, and that's now in, in publication. And then here's the step of the process where MRI is incorporated from diagnostic, diagnostic imaging of identifying the dominant lesion, both in DWI, DCE imaging, then utilizing it for contouring and treatment planning, and then utilizing that in the operating room um, for seed implant with MRI fusion, both real-time fusion and or cognitive fusion, and then looking at these in a post-implant setting to ensure that what was planned, which is right here, is what was delivered. And this can be done on a consistent basis with high quality for each patient now. And I think when we, the concept of radiosurgery is not unique to the field of radiation oncology. We have stereotactic radiosurgery with machines that deliver from uh, lecta, varian, accuray, and, and, and lecta with gamma knife. And so you can see the concept of this radiosurgery is very in tune with the field of radiation oncology. But this is also not MRI-guided radiotherapy or radiosurgery. There are MRI-guided machines like Vuray or Lecta with this MRI Linac. We have one of those. Uh, the, this MRI guided where you actually have a system that brings an MRI over the patient within a room. What this is, though, is MRI-assisted radiosurgery, and it can be done with any MRI that you have in your department today or have access to. You can capture these images with a 3D T2 sequence technique, upload that into the treatment planning system, and that becomes the, uh, your tool for contouring planning and then post-implant assessment. What other advantages does it have? It reduces overall time. We now don't have to do these pre-ultrasound simulations that take 30 minutes. This can be added on as a one single sequence to the diagnostic sequences. You don't need to be doing CT pubic arch evaluation anymore, so you can eliminate that CT, which is costly and time-wise. Reduction of treatment planning for an additional 30 minutes, reduced OR time. You now don't need to use a CT post-implant assessment, and you can remove the day 30 CT and MRI because you have all that information at day zero. And we've been able to demonstrate this and plot this with using time-driven activity-based costing, looking at every step of the process for the patient throughout their entire care of treatment. And we can look at it from traditional brachytherapy to MARS. So where are those advantages and where does MRI come? Well, MRI comes from the ultrasound simulation. You can eliminate it. Here's the 3 dt 2 sequence. Um, the virtual MRI simulation occurs with the treatment planning system once you incorporate that, and I'll show that in a moment. The MRI is now can be used from a diagnostic or a simulation, and then we can start using artificial intelligence for auto contouring, auto planning, and reduce this even further. And a lot of this planning can be done in the, in the cloud-based treatment planning system and centralize up into a cloud, have it evaluated, brought back, and planned for you, and then it can minimize and ensure consistent quality. Reduce ROR time with, with uh, stranded seeds by having this pre-planned and utilizing MRI markers so that you can identify and visualize these seeds under MRI and be able to perform adequate quality assurance assessment on each patient. So that then you can determine, do I need to take the patient back to the operating room to add additional seeds or what can I learn from this implant to improve my next implant? So it constantly provides a positive feedback loop. So MRI is now used from diagnosis to response assessment in every step of the QA process. Where we have really focused uh, time and attention from the diagnosis, it happens, of course, in our Department of Radiology, the MRI guided biopsies with our uh, multidisciplinary team and uh, colleagues in urology with MRI ultrasound fusion biopsies, and then we use MRI simulation treatment planning, uh, ultrasound fusion with MRI, and post-treatment assessment. Uh, this has all been published, and this is a concept of a virtual simulation where we bring the MRI images, we then simulate that probe with the patient legs in the dorsal orthotomy position versus their legs down in the MRI suite, and then that allows us to, to achieve this level of a grid. We then contour with these uh, 3D uh, T2 sequences so you can see uh, clearly what we're planning. We then establish where the seeds should be located 
in order to minimize heterogeneity around the urethra, to minimize the risk of morbidity, and to minimize the risk of retention, stricture, and urinary obstruction. The aim is to have all patients off their Flomax by six months, four to six months following the implant. We also have established nomograms. The deep secret in brachytherapy is that while you might prescribe a certain radiation dose, the amount of activity is uniquely dependent on the physician and what, and in that department. So everybody can say they're prescribing 125 or 144 gray, depending if it's palladium or cesium, I'm sorry, or, or iodine, or if it's cesium, 115 gray. You can utilize that same dose. The, the, the devil of the detail is how much activity you put into the patient. Because if you're not, if you don't utilize these nomograms, what can happen is you can put too much activity that can increase the amount of radiation going to the urinary bladder, urethra, and the uh, membranous urethra, and they can cause significant toxicities. And so we've published uh, this uh, nomogram from Mars that allows for us to say, based on the volume, how much activity needs to be implanted. Here's what it looks like in the operating room where you have the ultrasound and you have the MRI, and this is the fusion and they were able to ensure and do intraoperative optimization. So if additional seeds are necessary, I can simulate placing a seed here, look at what the, it does to the isodose distribution, and then make an assessment whether additional seeds are needed there or not. And that's what we call intraoperative optimization. And so you can see here, 200% of the prescribed dose goes in the peripheral zone where over 90% of the cancer is located. And yet here at 150%, we can carve that out to ensure that the external urinary sphincter and the urethra are minimizing the amount of heterogeneity and dose in that area. These are the MRI markers. These are in between this radioactive seeds on the strands. And what these markers allow you to do is to ensure that you can be able to visualize where the seeds are actually located because the seeds under, under MRI are titanium and they have a susceptibility artifact and are negative contrast. And it's difficult to identify if those are seeds, if they're strands, if they're spacers, or if they're vasculature. This again allows us to get adequate dosimetry by the uh, localizing where the seeds are in relationship to the markers to ensure that we are getting adequate high quality implant with 100% of our prescribed dose to uh, the entire volume and to ensure that we're not getting radiation dose to the anterior wall of the rectum to ensure that we're not creating a, an ulcer uh, and we can minimize morbidity. So MARS is critical for brachytherapy quality insurance and can ensure consistent quality implants in your practice, bring additional value and not cause additional expense, but also reduce your time. This also occurs now with HDR brachytherapy where we've developed markers so that you can then localize where the strands are under MRI that are implanted in order to be able to assess where the dose is going in the planning process. And this is all used in treatment planning. In fact, Dr. Rossi is the first one uh, in the country, not the world, that's actually utilized these markers to be able to do HDR Mars brachytherapy. And where's the advantage of that? It helps ensure that we're minimizing dose to the neurovascular bundles. We also are minimizing dose to the rectum. We can put a, a, a hydrogel a spacer in there as well to minimize even more dose to the rectum and then ensure that we plan higher doses to the dominant lesions to achieve that 0.2 at four year PSA to align it with the surgical definition of PSA failure. So in conclusions, uh, the next generation of prostate brachytherapy is here. It has significant innovation and quality assurance with MRI innovation. It addresses the Achilles heel of ultrasound and CT-based brachytherapy. It eliminates and ensures that the external urinary sphincter is protected to help further minimize the morbidity. It's cost effective. It reduces um, radiation oncology, urologist, physician uh, physicist time. And again, it ensures consistent high quality implant process for every patient. In summary, we have new outcome data with level one and level two data. Modern te techniques are aiming to minimize morbidity uh, in the urologic space. And this can be translated directly to your practice with MRI, nomograms, and a surgical cure definition 
uh, with brachytherapy. We have launched an initiative within the American Brachytherapy Society to certify and credential 300 credentialed brachytherapists in the next 10 years to ensure that the next generation does it with high quality and consistency uh, to ensure high quality with all of our patients. Thank you for your attention.